We are live on Facebook. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us this evening. This is John with Murder by the Book uh, with another uh, Facebook Live event. I'm so excited tonight that we're able to do an event for this anthology. I was just telling the authors beforehand in March as um, everything started to to close down and our event started getting canceled. Uh, C.S. Harris was one of the first ones that got canceled for us. And as people were, we were calling them, I kept telling them, oh, you know, she's got an anthology coming out in the fall. It's not a problem. I'm sure, I'm sure she'll be back for that one. It'll be great. We'll be able to have her in the store for the anthology. So even though we don't get to see her now, so here we are six months later and we are virtual, but I'm so excited that we were able to set this up uh, virtually. Tonight we are joined by all four contributors for The Deadly Hours. Um, we have, so I don't forget, we've got signed book plates that are signed by all four authors. And we also have these really great Deadly Hours Monsters and Mermaids maps. So when you order your copy, um, you will get one of those. If you have questions for any of the authors, you can drop those in the comments on Facebook. I'll be chatting with them, but I'll also be monitoring the comments so I can pass those along. So to get us started, I'm going to have our guests introduce themselves, and we're going to start with Susanna Kearsley. How are you tonight? Doing really well. Thank you, John. It's really, really great to be here, even though I don't get to come down in person, which is always one of my favorite things to do because I miss the barbecue. I really do miss the barbecue, I got to tell you. Um, thanks for everybody for showing up. Um, I'm Susanna Kearsley. I'm, the, I'm in Canada right now. Um, uh, so for anybody that's not familiar with my work, I write... Uh, a mishmash of everything. I'm really hard for, for most booksellers to figure out where to put me uh, on the shelf, but uh, Murder by the Book, they do a really great job um, and have been doing so for the entirety of my career. Um, so I, I write a bit of history, mystery, contemporary, historical, everything all mushed up together. Uh, my characters are normally uh, modern day characters who are dealing with a mystery that comes out of the past, but in this novella, they are entirely in the past dealing with a mystery that comes out of there. So uh, a little bit of everything. Um, my name is Annalie Huber, and I write the Lady Darby mysteries um, set in 1830s Britain and the Verity Kett mysteries set in uh, 1919 post-World War I um, majority Britain. Um, and I'm uh, up north, I'm in Indiana. Um, and I write the second story in the anthology and it actually happens to be a Lady Darby novella. So it's from that um, universe, those characters. So, um, and I'm so happy to be here, it's, it's fun. Hi everybody, I'm Christine Trent and I'm coming to you from Maryland uh, this evening and I'm really happy to be part of this anthology with my three dear friends and I have several historical novels. I write the Lady of Ashes mystery series and I also have a couple of books in the Florence Nightingale mysteries and the my entry into but the Deadly Hours is part of my Lady of Ashes series about a Victorian era undertaker, which I hope everyone enjoys. Hi, I'm uh, Candy Proctor. I also, I write as C.S. Harris. My, um, my novella is the last one uh, in the anthology. I write the uh, Sebastian St. Cyr uh, historical mystery series and under my name, C.S. Harris. It's set in the Regency period, but this, my novella is, uh, deals with, uh, uses a completely different set of characters and it's set uh, in World War II. So that, uh, so my first question then is for, for you, uh, Candace. So everybody else's are kind of tied into works that they've done already, but yours is a completely different set of characters. Were you tempted at all to try to set it in the Sebastian world or were you excited to play with something different? Well, uh, I, was, I was the last person brought on uh, when two other authors who shall remain nameless <laughs> dropped out. And so at that point, they already had two novellas set in the, uh, in the 19th century, and both of them would have come after uh, the Sebastian series. So I, it, I felt like it would have been awkward to, to put the novella in, kind of put it in the middle. Plus, the, the two who had dropped out had been doing the last two, so they really needed uh, someone to, to, to wrap everything up. And so even though they said, well, you can do Sebastian if you want, I said, no, I'll go ahead and, and do one that fits at the end that will you know, provide closure to the stories. And I was excited to do something different. I like, I, yeah, I've been writing, I'm 
currently doing Sebastian number 17. <laughs> That's a long time to stay with one group of characters. And I, and I think the only way I keep it fresh is that periodically I do something different. And I've done, uh, I've done a, a contemporary thriller series under the C.S. Graham name, and I've done a few other things. And so this was kind of my way to, as kind of a palate cleanser to, to, to refresh myself so I could go back with, you know, and, and feel like I'm kind of, I, it, it, it definitely helps me to, to come back. And then I'm, I'm glad to work with it, this, my series characters again, rather than kind of being like, oh, what am I gonna do now? <laughs> Uh, well, and Jude, Jude does have a link. Jude, the her hero does have a link into the Sebastian world. I, I I do have a I have a soft spot for Jude and Rachel, and I will warn you now, Johnny, that I do have a little campaign going to get <laughs> Candy to um, turn Jude and Rachel into a series characters. Um, she's she's going to be really tired of hearing me say this by the end of our virtual <laughs> tour. But I just I adored like her. I, I loved their rapport and I loved their chemistry and I finished the novella and I'm like, okay, so, so next story, please. Where are they going now? What are they going to do? And, you know, and I just, but he does have a link back. So you can tell them about that too. Cause yeah. people who love Sebastian might remember. He does. Uh, Sebastian has a, the, the series has a character called uh, Jamie Knox who may or may not be a uh, Sebastian mm. half brother. And, in one of the books, Sebastian goes and meets Jamie's family, and there's a character in that uh, in that novel who who is called Jupo, and he 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 meets a very not a very good end. And I always I like that character, <laughs> and I always felt bad about and the way he ended. And so I think that in a way, this novella was my way to <laughs> to resurrect that character and, and give him a happy ending. <laughs> Well, I, I definitely agree that I think that they would make a great series too. So I will join Susanna's campaign there. Um, so who, so how did the anthology come about? Was one of you, did one of you pitch it to an editor? Um, how did all of that start? Um, yeah, sorry. So I um, had wanted to collaborate with some authors on an, on an anthology and I reached out to Christine, who I knew, and asked her, you know, are you interested? What do you think of this, you know, idea? And she was like, yeah, let's 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 pursue this. So we kind of let it percolate for a, for a few months, and then I came back to her and I said, well, what if we had some kind of object that was passed through history that connected the stories? What if it was cursed, you know? Um, and so then we just kind of brainstormed, and she came up with the idea: how about a pocket watch? Um, and so then we kind of kind of made a rough idea of what the anthology would be. And then we reached out to Susanna and who I love. I was so thrilled when she responded that, yes, I'm in. So um, she joined us and we worked it all up and then we had some hiccups and things. And then uh, someone suggested um, Candy and we were all like, yes, <laughs> she's perfect. Um, she completed our, our, you know, our team and um, it kind of just went from there. So, so um, then, so for the three of the rest of you, then since you're like feature, I know Susanna, you don't do quite series series, but you have kind of characters that kind of mm -hmm. help shared world stuff. So, did you guys go into this knowing that you were going to use characters that you already had, or um, was it something you kind of discovered once you started plotting out? I think from the beginning, uh, at least for for Anna, Susanna and me, we knew immediately that we were gonna, we were gonna use series characters because time-wise it fits so well to, to start with Susanna in the beginning, you know, move into her Lady Darby, which is 1830s and then into mine, which is more like 1870. Uh, then it just remained, you know, where, where exactly was Candy gonna fit in? But it was very natural for us to use existing characters um, just for how it made the flow uh, for, for moving that pocket watch along. I mean, for, for me, it was it was kind of one of those serendipitous things that, that I had literally just been, it was right after I, right after I had left you, actually, um, in 2015, I was on my way from you to Phoenix. And I had my headphones on, I was listening to the playlist for Desperate Fortune. Um, and I landed in Phoenix and, and my characters moved to the playlist to the songs in the playlist. And my, my main character, the historical character in that one is Hugh McPherson, who is this guy that 
almost never talked in the book. And he was very difficult to write because of that. But when I had the headphones on, he did this, he did this really cool thing that happened to be on the ship that they were traveling on in a desperate fortune. And I thought, well, it would have been really nice if you had done that during the book, because I could have put that scene in the book. That would have been a really cool thing in the book. And and when I landed in Phoenix, um, Diana Gabaldone was interviewing me at Poison Pen. So I told her about it. When she came and took me out to dinner, I told her about it. And she said, well, that doesn't sound like something that happened in the book. It sounds like something that should be a novella. And I said, well, I've never written a novella before. How do you write a novella? And she and her advice was you aim for a short story, um, which I, you know, I didn't mean anything to me at the time. And then literally about two or three months later, Anna got in touch and said, I have this idea, you know, hear me out. I have this idea for a, an anthology. And I'm like, well, actually I have this idea for a novella. And it just kind of, it, it just it had started percolating at exactly the right time. And, and it just all fell into place at the, at exactly the right moment. So I don't know whether I would have been brave enough to try it if it hadn't happened at just that right moment. And so for all of you then, um, have you guys written short stories or novellas before? And can you talk about kind of the process of trying to do that when you're kind of used to doing kind of long form novels? And we can go in, in book order and start with Susanna again. <laughs> um, they, they all have instructions that if I ever try to do this again, they're supposed to drop something heavy on me because it took me, um, it's, they, they were all, they all turned in their, their novellas in like, a couple of months like boom 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 it took me three years to do my novella and they stayed with me the whole time because they're all marvelous wonderful people and I love them dearly um it took me a really really it took me as long to write this longer to write this than it took me to write most of my novels because I'm not good at writing short I don't do it well um at least I don't feel I do it well it was very very painstaking and you have this much smaller campus and you're trying to tell the whole story in this much smaller campus and it's really tricky um but it was so fun to get in and, and do this completely different form. Like, like Candy said, it's, it's, it was meant to be a palate cleanser. That was my idea was it was going to be this palate cleanser between books. Um, but it really was working a completely different set of muscles. And that's not always a bad thing as a writer to get in and work a completely different set of muscles. Cause it, it makes you, makes you a better writer in a lot of ways it, you're, you're, you're leaner and faster in a lot of different things, but it was, it was just, the whole process was really fun. Um, I think I'm the only one who's written a novella before. Um, I just wrote one, so none of us are really veterans at this. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, for me, it's definitely this, the pairing it down because it's like yeah. a quarter to a fifth of the length of a, my normal books. So it's getting everything in and all the character development and the setting and the, a full mystery within that shorter time period um, but I was really excited about it just to be able to work with some other authors on a project and, and, you know, collaborate. And also I have a character in my Lady Darby series, Bonnie Brock Kincaid. He's the head of an Edinburgh criminal gang. He's a lot of my readers love him because he's just a hoot. He's just very charismatic and he's a rogue and he's all kinds of trouble anyway. And so it was a chance to kind of focus on him more than I could do in a regular novel. So, um, so that was a fun, that was, that was my impetus, I guess. <laughs> I would agree with Anna that this was this really great opportunity to work with other authors. I'd written one little short story. I didn't, I didn't have novella writing experience under my belt. And when you're used to writing 100, 120,000 words or more, and now all of a sudden you're restricted to 25,000, that really is challenging to do it, to make it, ha to make it have all the, the seamless feel that your longer novels do. And I also view this as an opportunity to introduce my Lady of Ashes character to an audience who may not know her. You know, we're, we're all four of us are feeding off each other's audiences with this. And you want to introduce your character to completely new readers. And you want it to be done in such a way that they really are being introduced to the character. And they don't feel like they're that that you don't want that read the reader to have the sense that they're picking it up midstream because that's frustrating for a reader to feel like they're missing a lot of background that they need to have. So to me, that was another big challenge is reduced word count, creating all the Victorian atmosphere and, and everything having to do with the Victorian undertaker's world. Uh, 
which is a, an enormous world in the Victorian era, but then also making it uh, easy for a first time reader to jump into Violet Harper's world and, and be able to join in. But I love the challenge. And Susanna says she would never do it again and she wants to be clobbered by a frying pan, but I would work with these these three authors anytime. I, I would do another, I would do another I would, anthology. I would work with you guys. You would just have to give me like about a decade to, to I would, I would totally work with you. It's just, I would, I would just, you know, it's gonna, I'm not sure you'd work with me. I would just. We would. Yeah. Well, I had never done a novella either. I'd always wanted to, just never gotten around to it. Uh, I'm a person who plots her books out meticulously before I start. So mm -hmm. I know how many scenes it takes me to write a hundred thousand words. So I thought, well, I'll divide that by four <laughs> and that'll give me 25. And, and so I plotted it out and I think, well, I have to reduce my number of suspects and, and reduce the characters. And I had the advantage that I wasn't dealing with serious characters. So I didn't have this enormous uh, backstory that it, there's always a temptation to dump in there and you don't really want to do that with something that short so um, but I will admit that when I started writing it I got about 20 pages into it and I, I read back and I thought this is just awful and I realized that my problem was I was so conscious of every single word that I was focusing on writing the plot and I was skimping on my characterization. And I was giving plot and I was giving sense of time and place, but, but the characters were just so bare bones. And so I stopped and I decided that if I had to cut plot, that was okay, but I needed to make these people uh, come alive. And so I went back and, and made them personalities rather than stick figures I pushed around through this plot. And it, it made all the difference. But there was a point at which I thought, oh, maybe I'm not cut out to do this. And then I realized what I was doing wrong. So in the in the early process, Anna and Christine, did you guys sit down or get together and figure out kind of what the mythology for the watch was going to be? Or is that something that just kind of evolved as everybody was writing their own stories? Good, Anna. Um, we, uh, we didn't really get into that when we were approaching authors and um, like when we approached Susanna and that it was kind of like something we all did once we knew who was in and um, and it was just a really collaborative process I think a lot of everybody just kind of chimed in and it it was so easy to work with these ladies and uh Susanna was fabulous she went found us this watch and like you know we all threw in our own ideas about the design but she was really the spearhead about that and I think she came up with the the gold, yes, the gold from Cartagena. And um, so there was a lot of everybody just throwing in different ideas. Um, and we kind of just, a lot of people were, have been asking me about this, like, did we pass the story one to each other? Nope. We figured everything out that connected mm -hmm. them and we wrote them all at the same time, essentially. Yep. And then we just fit them back together. And we really didn't have a lot of stuff to like fix. Yep. It was We had done enough plotting ahead of time and figuring things out that we just had little minor tweaks. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, we had a Dropbox. So three of them went up really fast in the Dropbox uh, <laughs> after they, th there was a planning stage, you know, where, where there was a sort of back and forth and what is the watch going to look like and little obsessive compulsive me is kind of like, I know, I know I can go find a picture of it. And this is what the watch could look like. And here are the different cases of it. And this is what it would, you know, and, um, and then we were throwing all kinds of different things into it and, and, and stuff. And then three of them went off and wrote their stories and, and, you know, and then I would see them go up and it's like, I'm done, I'm done, I'm done. And, it's like, and I wrote and wrote and wrote. And, and then eventually mine went up. And and then that was the time when we kind of looked at each other's stories and, and pulled the threads through that needed to be pulled through. And it was kind of like, oh, okay, so now, and, and you know, for example, Candy's story at the end, she knew that she wanted to, um, my character, Mary, told a fairy tale in her story and Candy wanted the book to be, found in her story and parts of the so she would just leave a blank in her story okay so this, you know this is where Rachel's gonna find you know quote x from the fairy tale so she would leave a blank and I would supply the you know that that type of thing so that type of thing needed to be pulled through at the end but for the most part it was just four of us writing and waiting to see how it fit together at the end and that, that was fun that was like a little Christmas present at the end. It's kind of like, oh, now I get to read, you know, Anna's story and I get to read Christine. I get to read Christine's story and find out how the watch gets. The fun part was, it's like one of those, those 
exercises in in English class at school where you write a part of a story and you hand it off to the person next to you and they pick up the story and hand it off to the person next to them and 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 you see how a story grows and you know, we were handing the watch off to the next person and seeing what they did with it and it it's really quite a lot of fun to see. To me what was interesting is as Susanna says we really didn't read, read each other's stories till the end and you know I sat down and read the entire book beginning to end and to me I, I don't know if you others would agree with me to what struck me was how well the stories hung together and how the three of us sort of worked such that our voices it sounded like the, the same person wrote the entire book I think our voices melded together pretty well um, which is interesting given that you know we all write yes we all have mystery and romance and things in our books but you know we all write completely different things so I was really glad for that. Yeah, I, I'll agree. I, I felt like it, it definitely had kind of just just tone wise and everything like it didn't necessarily feel like it was kind of four different voices. Like you started the yeah. next story and it wasn't like there was this, just like, where did this came from? It, it all read seamlessly kind of like one really great story. And it's it's amazing to me that you guys were kind of able to do that without having one person have read them and just for it to just come together the way that it did, because I, I would never have guessed that. No, no. We just and that and that that's down to editing too. I mean, we had a we had a good editor in Deb Worksman at Sourcebooks who you know who kind of took everything and made sure that that got pulled all the way through too, and and managed our voices at the very end, and and you know caught all the little things that we maybe didn't catch of continuity to make sure that the final little bits glittered at the end where they should. So, and um, I just lost my train of thought. Um, so you mentioned did that you didn't have to make any, you didn't have to make any um, any like major changes to the story, and we kind of talked about uh, timeline. Did you guys all claim? Um, so I don't want to spoil anything, but did you guys all each like immediately claim what element you were going to use in relation to the the mythology of the watch? Um, I think yeah. I don't want to give too much away, but yeah. like for example the handoff that ends up happening between my story and christine's it was just i think christine actually came up with the idea and it was like oh my gosh that's perfect so it was like yeah. once we knew what the handoff was the element that went with it was like a, a given you know so yeah. um I, but i think there was a little bit of brainstorming like with the one that christine had because we had to figure out how is this gonna um well i could say this hers is air so it's like how do you do air you know so we, we got had to get creative you know and uh, yeah. it was fun it was a fun part of it though to have to brainstorm yeah so um we i'm gonna look at some of the questions so we had one question from like i'm like kind of tuning away from deadly hours for a second for each of you guys if nobody has read y'all outside of the anthology where should they start reading you once they finished uh deadly hours <laughs> once they finish deadly hours if, if deadly hours is their introduction to yeah so if they start with this and they're like okay i want i want more from this author where should where should they go next this is harder for you susanna because everybody else i know they just say <laughs> yeah pick up one of my things if well if they if they enjoyed deadly hours and they want to follow and they want to go back and see where hugh and mary started then desperate fortune um which is their origin book i guess but if they don't care and they just want what everybody calls my gateway drug book um then that would be the winter sea i think mm -hmm. um which is um probably the 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 book that everybody recommends people read although anna's favorite is the firebird because edmund is her her favorite so i was just yeah, gonna say i've yeah. been recommending Piper too because it's got um, anna and edmund so yeah so um, yeah. They're, they're, my books aren't written in any particular order the only two that my readers say you should read in order and i kind of i i kind of agree with them i didn't write it that way um but if you have a chance to read the winter sea and the firebird in that order winter sea and then firebird you probably ought to because there is a teeny tiny spoiler that you will save yourself if you do it that way um but i try to always write them so that you could just pick them up and i try to always write them in case people can't ever get you know the previous book um and but 
pretty much anything. You know, Winter Sea is probably a good place to start. Um, but if you read, if 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 the Deadly Hours is your very first thing that you're reading of mine, and you want to explore those characters, then go back and read um, Desperate Fortune, and you'll see where Hugh and Mary started. So. Um, for me, because it's a Lady Darby novella, obviously, um, I try to make all my Lady Darby books ones you can just jump in and not be confused. But um, if you really wanted to learn and have the whole journey with the characters, then book one is The Anatomist's Wife. So that's probably what I would recommend. And if you wanted to jump into something of mine, it would be the first book in the Lady of Ashes series, which is called Lady of Ashes. I actually wrote that as a standalone novel that the editor then turned into a series and gave Violet all kinds of adventures. And that is certainly her backstory of how she got involved in undertaking, how she meets uh, her husband, Sam, and so forth. So that would definitely be the place to start. Well, my Sebastian St. Cyr series is, like I said, going on 17 now. Um, I do, again, I write them so that a uh, reader can come at each one uh, without having read the series, but the series does have an overarching yep. um, de personal development in Sebastian's life. So if one could, probably the best place to start would be with um, What Angels Fear, which is the first one. Mm -hmm. I also, I mean, it depends on what kind of, those are mysteries, if that's what a person likes. I've also written seven uh, historical romances, which I am finally getting around to putting up on <laughs> Amazon. <laughs> I got, I've got, almost got six of them up at this point. So, so if that's a, what a person likes, one could also go back to those. They were published uh, at the beginning of my career, and uh, I'm happy to finally be getting them back out again. And are those under are those under C.S. Harris or are those under Candace Proctor? Those are under Candace Proctor. Yeah. So one of the things I like about um, the Deadly Hours is how the body count in each novella tends to grow the further. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you start off and there's maybe there's maybe one, but by the end of it, you know, there there are definitely more murders. They're maybe a little bit grisly or not super grisly at all by any stretch of the imagination, but they're a little bit more. Um, so I, I was really impressed by how you guys were able to, to to do novellas and actually keep kind of the mystery story structure in all of them. Did that help um, with plotting out the novella and the plot wise to actually have kind of the, the mystery framework for them? I don't, I don't plot um, that much. So that, that's probably why it took me a long time to write. To write. That's probably something um, that I'm not a very good plotter. Um, I'm a pantser, which makes writing mysteries a little trickier yeah. um, <laughs> because you always hit a point where you do have to start plotting. You would, you do have to start sort of gathering everything in and once you have seen what's on the page and, and hemming it in. Um, but yeah, having the, the mystery framework because I, you know, I started off my career writing more romantic suspense, mystery, mystery um, stuff. And that was, that was kind of where I was placed more genre wise. Um, I haven't changed what I've written. It's just, that's where I was shelved more. And um you know, so it's been kind of interesting to to be a little freer and able to you know kind of move back into into that with the the storylines a little bit. But yeah, the body count body count of I I think again without spoiling, I think mine's one. I think it's one one in a one in an unconscious person. I think you can't really count him. He's just but uh, yeah, I'm, I would say definitely. I mean all of my books, the mystery is definitely the framework and having the framework, it kept, I guess for me, it kept me from throwing in too many subplots. I just had to focus on the one mystery because <laughs> um, I tend to throw a lot of things into the books. So um, that, I think that helped me, helped constrain me in my plot, so. My, my books tend to have, um, we're dealing with an undertaker here. So there tend to be a lot of bodies all over the place. And some of them die mysteriously, some of them not so mysteriously, but that was something I really had to control for this being a novella is not having, shall we say, extraneous deaths that may or may not have a sinister reason for having occurred and things like that and trying to keep it down to, you know, a body count of only two or three. 
I have a tendency to screw bodies around. One time my editor said to me <laughs> after I sent the book in, she said, can't some of these people be allowed to live? <laughs> So I think the word count, the, you know, having to be constrained by 25,000 words helped keep the, the body count down, down. You know, I had some, some kind of little bit of uh, roughing up of some characters, but uh, yeah, the body <laughs> count, I could only have fit so many murders in that short of a space. Um, so uh, from the questions, I have a question for, for Susanna. Uh, Chelsea asks, do you think you'll do any more writing where you just have kind of one single historical character instead of kind of the dual timeline or multiple perspective stuff? Actually, it's interesting. Uh, the one I'm writing now, the book, I'm, the novel that I'm writing now, it's called The Vanished Days. Um, and I'm just, I'm just about done. I'm so close to being done. Mm -hmm. um, and it's coming out next year. It's, it's dual timeline, but it's all in the past. So mm -hmm. it's a little bit of a departure. It's, um, so it's kind of edging that way. It's uh, and it's told from a male viewpoint too. Um, the 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 bulk of it is told from a male viewpoint. So it's um, it's all historical mm -hmm. instead of going into the present day, which actually turned out <laughs> really well because I didn't know that you know two years into the writing of it we were going to have you know a, a pandemic which would have made it really tricky to do the the modern day part if i was doing it one of my usual uh, dual time ones but i'm th there are there are different challenges when you're doing all historical stuff and trying to do trying to do what i do um because you i'm used to ex explaining things to the reader a certain way when you're trying to when you do dual timeline it's easy because somebody in the present day can just explain to somebody else in the present day what happened in the past and you can come in and out of the narrative a lot and skip the boring parts and go back into the narrative you can't do that when you're all in the past and you you have that whole issue of the as you know bob the stuff that everybody all you know you have two two characters discussing things that they both already know looking at each other going why are we discussing this we already know this we both you know we're living through it right now why are we talking about the you know why we eat this stuff that we already know that we eat every day type thing you know it, it, it so there are all these challenges that you have um but it's been it's been interesting and it's kind of almost like writing the novella was my little training wheels for doing the book that i'm doing now because it was male viewpoint and all in the past so i i'm a firm believer in everything that you do as a writer is is like a stepping stone for the next thing that you do as a writer and even as i was um you know, cursing myself at times for, for for taking on the challenge that I didn't think I was up to. Um, it turned out that that gave me the toolbox that I needed to go on to this this new novel, and it was good. Uh, so, so, well, as we talk about, kind of three of you guys have already done, are, are writing in kind of worlds that you know already, time periods that you know already. So, did that mean that you had to do less research? And then on the flip side, Candace, since you were writing something that's completely different from what you were writing before, can you talk about a little about your research process? Um, I I have a PhD in history, so I used to teach um, 20th century World War One, World War Two, um, but Teach, teaching a history class is very different from writing a novel because with a novel, you have to deal with all the, the mundane uh, aspects of life that were so radically changed in England and in the Second World War. So yeah, I did have to do a lot of research uh, for it. Um, but that was, and that was a lot of fun. I always over-research my books because that's my favorite thing. History, that's why I poured a bunch of my years of my life into it. So that was, yeah, it was a lot of fun. Any, anybody else, did you guys find that you had to do much, much research or were you able to just kind of get in because you were kind of familiar with, with the territory already? There's, there's always research. I know for mine, I always, in every story I write, I like to introduce some new aspect of undertaking or funerals, mm -hmm. uh, mourning customs, all that kind of thing. I like to introduce something new uh, in every book. And so, but again, I was dealing with this much more compact amount of space. I did get a, a couple of things in, but uh, it was definitely less research for me, definitely less. Yeah, I had less research also just because it's already an established world and all that. But um, 
I think the most research I did was medical stuff because for my plot to work, I had to figure out, I had to, I ended up finding this little, you know, small little known typhus epidemic that happens in uh, our outbreak. It's not really an epidemic in Edinburgh at the time of my novella, which fit perfect. I needed it. So <laughs> uh, that was probably the most research I did just that, that aspect. Oh, there's always research, Johnny. There's always research. I'm, a, I'm down a rabbit hole, like, you know, <laughs> all the time. I love my rabbit holes. And it, so, you know, like poisons and um, Portofino, even uh, all these, you know, because obviously I, you know, you can't go back to 1733 Portofino and know what it looked like. So um, all just so much, so much. But it, it's, it's, that's part of the fun. And, and out of all that research, you might get the one sentence you need or the one little you know, I was reading people's travelogues from 1733 and 1735 and where they had gone and what, what the harbor looked like and all kinds of different things to figure out what they would be eating in their one meal at the inn. And then I realized that Hugh doesn't care what they're eating because he's a guy. He's just looking at what, you know, what the room looks like. And I had all this, you know, couple of days worth of research and I had to throw it out the, out the window because he didn't really care. And, you know, so... It, it, but it's fun. It's it's all part of the process, and it's never wasted. I'll use it somewhere. Somebody will go to Portofino and eat that meal that I that I researched, and it'll it'll all be worth it somewhere. I will say, Anna, reading yours now hits completely differently than it would have like six or nine months ago dealing with the with the typhus outbreak. I was reading. I was like, oh, this is a little too real at the moment. <laughs> I know in my Lady Darby that came out in uh, book eight that came out in April, they're, it's, they're going into a cholera epidemic. Oh, no. And I was like, um, I promise I had no idea this was going to happen. I keep writing about diseases. and <laughs> But it is back to what Anna was saying earlier. It is always really great when you can get a piece of history to line up with something that you actually need to have happen because then you can write it in your author's note afterward and say this is actually the truth <laughs> you know when it's lining up with some cholera outbreak or or some rash of murders or something like that i love when i'm able to make my fictional plot line fit into something that actually happened and that is something that most people don't know so that you can say yes this is actually true that's mm -hmm. to me that's just gold uh, one of the things I really enjoyed too was at the end of each novella where you guys had kind of the, the moment where you could kind of do like the acknowledgements and you could clearly tell how much fun all of you guys had working with each other just by 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 your 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 author's notes there and kind of the comments about the editor you could all tell that this was kind of really like kind of a project that everybody loved and everybody was really excited to be a part of so that was that was fun to read yeah. so if you guys are reading don't skip those no it was fun mm -hmm. Let's see. Um, uh, so Margaret says, yeah, she picked up the book because of Susanna, but she'll definitely be reading the others after meeting their characters in this book, which is great. That's what that's what we were really excited for too. Um, or I mentioned cats spotting. Yeah, my cats are like really interested in what's happening. Over here. <laughs> I can see the tails. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Apparently, one of them got locked downstairs in the guest room earlier, so she's super comfy tonight because. Um, or she's super cuddly because she was, you know, hiding. Uh, so Bryce asks, do you guys have any writing tendencies, whether it's a glass of wine early in the morning? Uh, do you listen when you write? So can you guys talk a little bit about writing rituals? Well, I'm finding more and more, um, now that I'm at, getting towards the end of the book, I don't, I don't have a lot of rituals. I, I, I tend to need silence. Um, I get, I'm very easily distractible. Mm -hmm. um, so I... I usually have these headphones on if other people are moving around the house, which given the pandemic has been like all the time, people mm -hmm. are moving around my house. now. So I, I have a white noise app on my, my phone and I'll plug in the phone and put the white noise app on, which is, gives me silence. But the other thing I do is once every, I, I wait till everybody's gone to bed. And I used to do this a lot when I was like a young mom. Well, not that young. I had my kids when I was in my thirties, but when I was a mom and I would wait till everybody went to bed and I would write until like, you know, two, three o'clock in the morning. And I'm sort of reverting to that now that I'm getting towards the end of this manuscript. <laughs> the other day, my, my husband came down uh, <laughs> and it was like seven thirty in the morning and I hadn't been to bed. And he's like, what are you doing? And I was like, but I, but I was writing and, and you know what it's like when the guys, when the book is just going, 
and you you're afraid to go to bed because you're afraid if you go to sleep you'll lose that mm -hmm. that sentence or that story and it won't come back again so i'm finding that 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 quiet time when everybody is asleep and the house is just mine and i'm just, it's just me and the book and and that world is is just kind of back again so i've I, that's something i haven't had for a long long time um so maybe you know maybe 10 years i haven't i haven't been in that mode and it's really a wonderful thing it's uh, and it i don't know if anybody else has been feeling this through through this time period since oh maybe 2016 um but it's been a very stressful time and when your conscious mind is full of a lot of things that you're working through and that you're trying to crowd out um it's very hard to access your subconscious and your subconscious is where the story comes from so just being able to tap into that story place is is just a really nice feeling and anything that allows you to do that that allows you to have that quiet is is good so it's whatever whatever lets you do it and um, i have two young children so <laughs> a lot of times i'm just taking what i can get <laughs> um but optimally um i get my um six-year-old on the bus in the morning at um seven o'clock and then I go to write and my husband and I are both are working from home right now. So he takes care of the three-year-old and I get to write from um, seven till like two thirty when my, um, well, my three-year-old goes down for a nap. And as long as she naps, then I get to work till two thirty when my, my uh, six-year-old gets off the bus. But um, I, as long as I have my computer and I like coffee or tea and I have these blue, blue light blocking glasses I wear because I get eye twitches and fatigue um and that's really all I need and um and it's I have less writing time now than I did before I had kids but I actually get more done because my brain I've it's like I can't procrastinate so it's easier for me to switch into writing mode I don't know how that happens and I'm just glad it does <laughs> because I never would get anything done um so yeah that's that's me anyway <laughs> In terms of ritual, uh, I suppose, I don't know if I'm odd or not, but obviously a large cup of coffee to start. But I find that it is very hard for me to start writing until I feel like I've taken care of other things. In other words, I have to kind of know the bills are paid, the laundry's done, dishes are done. Like things have to be at like a certain level of calm before I feel like I can focus on writing. So sometimes writing doesn't happen till later in the day because I get so wrapped up in doing other things that must be accomplished in order to write. Uh, like Susanna, I like a white noise program. I put on headphones to completely cover my ears. And uh, I do have a favorite one that's sort of the sound of children playing on a playground, but there are others I like, you know, the sound of rolling, the crashing waves. I like that a lot. Um, uh, I actually have one that is being like in a, a bomber, a World War II bomber aircraft. I've got some really odd ones. And that hum is very nice. And also I've got another one that's the sound of being in an airport that believe it or not, it's, it doesn't work when I'm actually in the airport, but when I'm, when I'm <laughs> sitting and writing, listening to the noises of an airport, you know, announcements being made and things like that. I don't know. There's something about that that goes to the background and makes it easy for me to write as well. So I like having that. Well, I've been at this for so many decades that I'm, I'm thinking about it. My process has really changed. There was a time when I had little kids and I was like Susanna and I would sit up till two, three, four o'clock in the morning. I, I, I'm too old now. I can't do that. I don't have little kids anymore. But now I have a retired husband who I'm, I'm having to adjust to. I'm so used to having the house to myself. He used to leave for work 7, 7.30 and not come home till 6 o'clock. So I was used to having the house all to myself. And now I don't have that anymore. And uh, I realized the other day, too, that he used to set my schedule. You know, I would start working and then when he came home I quit and on the weekends we would go do fun things and it occurred to me the other day that I no longer have that kind of schedule and that I'm working until you know I set eight nine o'clock I work weekends and I thought I realized I need to stop this I need to put myself back on a 
I work so many hours a day and then I quit and I do something fun. Even if I can't go out the way you used to, I have hobbies I actually used to do that I haven't done. Um, in terms of rituals, I, uh, I used to compose at the computer like most normal writers, but after Katrina, our, our house flooded and there weren't any work crews. So we were re rebuilding on ourselves and it took a long time. And I didn't have a laptop. I had a, a desktop, but I didn't have any place to set it up because we were kind of bouncing around between different houses. And so I started, I had a book due. I had actually sent the proposal in like, like the Friday before Katrina hit. And so uh, they reached a time when I thought, okay, I got to sit down. I got I've got to start writing this thing, but how? So I just got out a, a notebook and a pen and I started writing and I discovered, I actually like writing by hand. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, there's something about the tactile stimulation. They've proven it actually stimulates the creative part of your brain. And so I have, even though I now have my office back <laughs> the way it was, it's no longer bare walls and concrete. Um, I, I have stuck with that notebook and pen. And, and then after each chapter, I, or sometimes even a scene, if it's a long scene, I'll go and I'll type it up and then I'll edit it. But the, the, my actual first draft of every scene is, is written by longhand. It's, it's a weird, weird process, but um, I really find it works for me. Kendry, we're, we're kindred spirits because I will frequently do, I don't write my entire books longhand, but I will for a break sit and write longhand. I am a huge fountain pen aficionado. I love fountain pens. <laughs> there is nothing more pleasurable than to sit down with a fountain pen and like a journaling book and to start writing that way. And to and I agree that it kind of really gets the creative juices flowing. You engage with words in a much different way when you write longhand than when you're typing into a computer. Yeah, I, I do that in the tub. When I, you know, I remember I'd, I'd, I'd said that but one of the things I, started doing when I was I was giving Anna this advice because when I was a when my kids were really small the way I survived was when my husband got home from work I would I would hand him the children and go upstairs to the bathroom and put on the fan for white noise and get in the tub and he had the kids over the supper hour and I would just be in the tub and and the uh, the uh, I couldn't hear anything um, and I'm really short. I'm like five foot nothing. So I could float in our tub and it was like one of those de sensory deprivation tanks. And, and my, my, um, I got into kind of like theta mode and my, my uh, imagination would just like go. And I learned to keep a pad of paper beside the tub and I, I will write like entire scenes and stuff. So I have all these, I mean, I've got them, you know, here, like just, all kinds of stuff, you know, so I get chapters and chapters like written like that. And then I come down and put them into the, into the book that way. So there's all these little bits and pieces that I have to try to remember to put into a file somewhere. Otherwise I lose them because they're, they're usually not the bit I'm working on right now. There's something that's going to happen further on in the book. I just don't know where, I don't know where they're going to slot in. I just know they are at some point, maybe. And, um, it's the characters will just start talking to each other and I just write down what they're going to, what they're saying and hope to heck that I'm smart enough to file the paper away and put it in the book where it belongs. So yeah, water is kind of magic for yeah. writing. It's just, there's something, whether it's a bath or a shower or a swimming pool or doing the dishes, I don't know what, there's something about the water that it, well, it's, it's that you're able to mind is able to float your conscious mind is yep. absorbed with something else and so you're able to just kind of let go and I mean when I'm stuck somewhere that's my favorite thing to get unstuck because just go water get in the water <laughs> um so Molly asks what do y'all think about using actual historical figures in fiction depends on the historical figure um for me um it depends on how I'm using them I have, um, everybody's different. I, I would never judge another writer for how they choose to do it. And I, I just think that, you know, whatever I say about how I do it is only for me. And that's the only answer I can ever give. Um, but I always think about Olivia de Havilland, right? And the lawsuit that she had recently against the people that did the TV movie um, about her and her sister 
where they made her say something about her sister that she claimed she would never have said. And she cared enough to come out of a very reclusive life to say, I would never have said that word. You know, she cared enough about that. And, and I always feel like I have a huge responsibility to the lives that I'm putting on the paper and they can't come back from the dead and, and defend themselves. And a lot of the time I am dealing with real people. A lot of the time I'm dealing with real ordinary people. They weren't famous. They were ordinary folk. Um, a lot of the time I have access to their, their journals or their letters or that sort of thing. So I think really carefully about how I'm portraying them. If I do not know for certain that they were nasty or that they were traitors or that they were you know, even something as small as, you know, did they abandon their children? Were they, you know, were they alcoholics? Were they, if I don't know for certain these things, then I don't put that on the paper. Um, I think very carefully about what I'm doing to the legacy of these real people, because they can't defend themselves. Um, but if I do know that someone was a, you know, rat bastard, then I don't have any compunction about putting it on. Um, and if I'm dealing with someone like, say, King James VIII, who has been dealt a terrible hand by historians, and I'm reading his actual letters, and I know what he actually said, and historians said that he said something completely different, I feel it's almost my responsibility to correct that, that I can't leave that uncorrected. So it flips the other way. It's like, I, you know, when I have him standing somewhere, and I know that he said something different than what historian said he said, then I feel like I have to put that back on the page in a different way. So, you know, I, th I, think, I think you have to find your own boundaries of what, what works within your moral code and work within that. But I would never judge somebody else for how they choose to do it because it's, it's, there's no point in it. Every writer finds their own way of working within what works for them. I, I'm the same mode echo, Susanna. That's kind of my philosophy. And uh, I mean, I have real care, real historical figures. Usually they're secondary, um, whether they're famous or not. Um, and if if there's something I've, I'm not comfortable about that I'm worried that it, it paints them a bad light or if there's a murder that happens at an estate that didn't really happen, a lot of times I'll change the name even just slightly just because I don't want to attribute something and hurt someone, you know, in a way that, you know, that's, it, you have a responsibility, I guess, to what you're putting on the page, just like Susanna said. So even in small things, you know, maybe people wouldn't care that I, made up a fictional murder at their estate 200 years ago but I to me it matters so I just I'll change one letter even in the you know and so you know what it really is but it's not you know so I love writing about real historical people uh for Lady of Ashes you know my my undertaker ends up doing work for Queen Victoria and Prince Albert I love writing about this too uh it's an immense amount of fun. I like to try to crawl into the head of somebody who's well documented. I mean, every minute of their lives is, you know, completely well documented and trying to figure out, you know, how do I use them in a fictional way that is also believable, that also fits within their very well documented lives and personalities. And, and I know that when people read my book, that they are, many people are intimately familiar with all the details of Victorian life and Queen Victoria's and Prince Albert's and their children and all that. And I find it a great challenge. And a lot, as I said, it's to me a lot of fun to try to crawl into their heads and be them, uh, even for the, the short period of time on the pages. I really love it. I'm kind of with Susanna. I, I have a certain little discomfort with with using um, historical characters. I don't think I could ever use one as a, as my primary character. I just it would just seem wrong. I'm I'm one of those people that that goes to a a movie and sits there and complains about all the liberties that are taken with history. So. If I, I mean, I have used secondary characters who were real people, whether they're, you're talking about the Prince Regent or Princess uh, Charlotte or 
Alfred Lord Tennyson even I used him when he, when he was a child I always try to make sure that I read uh, you know as many biographies of them as I can I read their letters and their journals if they're available so that I really have a handle on both how the person expressed themselves and and the kind of person that they were and I and I I don't let myself take liberties with them one of the most fun things was when I was writing Firebird, for example, I have a character that that I, I get very close to the the characters that carry through some of the, the books, the, the books that the the Murray family of Abercarney sort of calls them the Abercarney books. And I that's what I call them, too, because they that's what they are, really. The Winter Sea, the Firebird, um, the book I'm writing now, The Vanished Days, is an Abercarney book. Um, and they deal with the Murray family of Abercarney and the families that, that got interwoven with them. And one of the characters that comes in and out is a, is a sea captain by the name of Thomas Gordon, who went on to become an admiral at the court of, of uh, Peter the Great. And um, I've read a lot of his letters and his letter book that he kept through the 1720s. And it's wonderful to read his letter books and to get it, you know, totally inside his his mind because the letter book wasn't just the letters that he sent it was the, it was the copies he kept of all the letters that he sent but you got to see what he crossed out like the corrections he made to what he would have sent and didn't send you got to see the the notes he kept from his wife that she had given him for like you know while you're in such and such a harbor can you pick me up you know this many yards of this material because we need to make clothes for Jeannie because she's getting too big and all the little notes he kept from his his kids who died all the little you know everything that was important to him and you get a sense of the man so you get a sense of what was what was within his moral code and what he would do and didn't do and what was important to him and when you get a sense of that person then you you know what he would have done and not done on the page and and also it gave me it allowed me to not only use his own words when i was creating his dialogue and his patterns of speech but it also let me know that you know at at six o'clock in the morning on a certain day he was standing right here you know at this crossroads in saint petersburg so i could put him there talking to these people and move the plot around him that's really a fun thing to do when you're writing too so those are the fun things to to do but so before we wrap up for this evening, we've been talking about uh, The Deadly Hours, which has only been out for a couple of weeks now. But can you guys tell us uh, either what you're working on or what you've got coming out next? Um, I actually, <laughs> I have a Verity Cat book coming out in two and a half weeks. <laughs> no, uh, September, September 29th, book four, A Pretty Deceit is um, releasing. And the next Lady Darby book, book nine, um, A Wicked Conceit, <laughs> um, comes out April 6th of next year. Love that title, A Wicked Conceit, you said? That, that's a great title. Uh, I've got two Lady of Ashes books that are in various stages of completion, which I've laid both aside because I'm working on something that's a complete departure for me because it's actually a modern set novel that takes place here in my home state of Maryland. So therefore, of course, there's a bunch of historical research that goes to it because I'm trying to bring things from the past into the present, not in a Susanna kind of way, but making reference back to it. And I'm having a great deal of fun with that, especially because uh, a dog is sort of a large side character and I'm having a lot of fun having a dog be a large side character for it. But that's as much as I wanna say about that book. <laughs> Well, my next Sebastian uh, St. Cyr book, uh, number 16, What the Devil Knows, will be out in April. That's my typical uh, release on this April for that series. And then I um, have almost finished the number 17, which unfortunately doesn't have a title. I'm open to anybody who can please give me a suggestion. Uh, this one has been a lot of fun for me because it's set in Paris. I lived in uh, Paris for a year, and so it's been um, it's been a joy and a, a big change for me to have Sebastian and Hero uh, leave London and, and go to Paris. And of course, it's set in March of 1815 when uh, certain somebody escaped from Elvis. So it, it ties in that history too. So 
I've been having fun with that, and I didn't get to go to Paris the way I might have liked to at this time, but. Um, How do you normally get your titles, Candy? Uh, I think, you know, that the first ones, I had like the first three or four before I ever even started writing the series. And then once I was in that pattern, I thought maybe this wasn't a good idea. Sometimes they come to me early. Sometimes I, I really have to, to strain. Sometimes it'll just be, Oh, oh, there was uh, one time I was having a horrible time coming up with a title and a friend of mine was on Facebook. He's, he's a poet. He was just throwing out lines of poetry. And I was like, oh, <laughs> I immediately sent him a text message. Can I please use that line of poetry? He said, well, yeah, there's no poem that goes with it. Like, That's all right. I'll use it. So yeah, usually something comes along, but this one for some, I mean, maybe it's, maybe it's the turmoil that we're going through. I just, you know, I, I don't know if I've ever gotten to the end of a book practically and, and didn't have the title. I'm just constantly looking for, for inspiration and <laughs> not getting any right now. So then, so then one last question uh, before we wrap up then. Um, so for the Deadly Hours, did you guys have alternate titles or was it Deadly Hours from, from the get-go? <laughs> <laughs> didn't we have a ton we i think we, we had like a, we had like a how many about 30 or 40 we had a whole yeah. list it was a whole list but they all had they all had like hours or clock or like it was it was all something to do with the watch and then we just yeah. we we just kind of we we I, I can't remember we just we we all just threw a whole pile into a big list right and then narrowed it down wasn't that what we did and you're okay. trying to make your editor happy in it in other words yeah. the editor has to accept the title so you just keep coming up with title after title after title and I, you know the four of us would just as suzanne says we would just throw a bunch of titles into a pile and the editor you know it's either no i hate all of these go back to the drawing board or well i kind of like this one how can we work with this title but make it something better and but yeah, I think we went through a lot of titles to get through the deadly hours. We did. I don't. Yeah, I don't even remember whose title it was. <laughs> no, I think it just it just kind of like we we kind of whittled it down to like we kind of whittled our giant sheet down to like you know maybe four or five that we all liked, and then kind of threw those at at the editor and said pick one, and then yeah, right. I think well, it, I think it came to that. Uh, so if you guys uh, tuned in late once we are done chatting this evening, Facebook will archive the video so you'll be able to watch it from the beginning. We'll also be uploading it to the store's YouTube channel in the next couple of days so you can watch it there. Um, so that way, if you know anybody who's not on Facebook, if they want to watch, you can check it out there. So we have been talking about Deadly Hours, or The Deadly Hours, a new anthology featuring Susanna Kearsley, Annalie Huber, Christine Trent, and C.S. Harris. As I mentioned before, we've got signed book plates signed by all four authors. And we also have these really cool maps that the publisher put together. Um, so when you pre-order, you will get those. Uh, just a quick Murder by the Book update. We are, we've expanded our curbside pickup hours. So we are there Monday through Saturday, 10 to 6 for curbside pickup. We've also started doing um, browsing by appointments on Fridays and Saturdays. So you can visit the store's website to book appointments. Um, you can give us a shout, 713-524-8597. We're still processing um, online orders at murderbooks.com around the clock. Also wanted to mention um, if we know that book buying isn't necessarily in everybody's budget at the moment, but uh, at the moment, the best way to support the store and these authors who have been so generous with their time for us tonight is to purchase um, one of their books, if not The Deadly Hours, one of the ones in the earlier series. Um, if you're not sure where you wanna start, we can definitely help you out with that. Um, we have also created a virtual tip jar. So we've dropped a link to that down in the comments. So if you you know maybe can't afford a book, but you still wanna let us know that you're appreciating the events. You can do it that way. Um, I think that's all of the- Well, I just want to say too that my my mom like had an independent bookstore when I was a little girl. And bookstores, independent bookstores are incredibly important, not just to the community that they're in, but to everything that we all do. And this is a very difficult time for independent bookstores and so anything that that we all do to support them through this you know it's it's extremely easy to go on and do the click for the, the big guys but you know the big guys don't care the way that independent bookstores do for for people like us and i you know i i would personally really appreciate it anything that anybody out there will do to continue to support 
the people that have supported me since I first started writing, which was 26 years ago, been published. It's been the independent bookstores that have had my back the whole way through. So I would just like to put that little plug in there for you, Johnny, because. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's, it's um, the, the weirdest part of this has been, it's great that we're open by appointment now because we've missed that connection with, you know, not, not actually being able to have authors in the store and seeing them get to interact with readers and not being able to interact with readers themselves. We were telling people the first day we opened for appointments was independent bookstore day. And we were kind of joking and warning people that we're making appointments. It's like, we we're going to throw 47 books at you when you walk in the door because we just haven't <laughs> so long. Um, and then, you know, we also had to realize that some of our hand selling muscles were a little rough. We're a little rusty. People would ask for something. We're like, what is that book? Um, but so yeah, we're we're happy to be able to to actually have customers in the store again. And unfortunately, we're not able to have you guys in the store again. Susan and okay. our, our our barbecue after this. Also, I, mention, I forgot one thing. So Anna mentioned that she's got the new Verity Kent book coming out. Um, I will be chatting with her on Monday, October 5th, here live on Facebook. So make sure you guys come back for that. And then we'll be chatting with uh, Sherry Thomas the next night. So we've got lots of great stuff coming up and you can visit murderbooks.com to see all of that. Uh, ladies, thank you so much for joining me this evening. It's been really great chatting with you. Hopefully we will get to do this uh, in the store sooner than later. So you guys take care and we'll talk with you soon. Thank you thank so much. Bye, thank, you, John. thank you. Thank you.